Our sermon text today is from Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 20. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked, Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, well, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he warned his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. This is the word of our Lord. Dear Christian friends, by age 18, Edwin Thomas Booth was playing lead roles in Shakespearean tragedies throughout the United States and Europe. He was a well-recognized face in the 1860s, along with the rest of his acting family. His brother John, however, had a bad effect on his reputation. John gave his last performance, you could say, on April 14, 1865, when he jumped from the booth of President Abraham Lincoln down to the stage of the Ford Theater. And as a result, his brother Edwin's reputation was changed too. He was now no longer the famous actor, but the brother of the assassin. Perhaps his reputation would have changed had people known that just two years earlier, he had rescued a young boy from being crushed by a moving train in Jersey City. Seeing that the boy had been pushed from the platform by the crowds, Edwin wrapped his leg around the railing and pulled the boy up by the collar. Now the boy recognized him, but Edwin didn't know who it was until he received a letter from General Grant's chief secretary thanking him for saving none other than Robert Todd Lincoln, the son of his brother's future victim. One of the most important things that you possess is your reputation. It's important for leaders of countries and businesses and employers and employees, teams and friendships. In fact, God dedicates the Eighth Commandment to protecting reputations. One thing that we do or say can affect the reputation of a whole family, a team, or even a business. This is true when it comes to a church or a congregation, too. What one person who is a part of that congregation says or does can impact the rest of the reputation of that entire congregation. Last week, we saw how God's church is for sinners. Remember that? Now you would think then that God's church, the Holy Christian church, which is made up of all believers everywhere, would then have such an awful reputation since it's made up of sinners. that It would be too awful for God to put up with. Surely he would have to disassociate himself from those who belong to his body of believers. Surely this body shouldn't be able to stand and has no credibility. It's true that visible churches and congregations and denominations come and go on the scenes of world history. They change from inside and out. And yet God's church the Holy Christian Church, the body of believers of which Jesus Christ is the head, endures. And it will endure until the end of time. But it's not because of the reputation of the people who make up this group. Rather, it's because of Jesus' reputation. In our final lesson, Jesus asks an important question. And it is not because he is longing for some popularity and attention. He asks this because it has everything to do with their salvation and with the world's salvation, with your salvation and mine. Who do you say I am? 
he contrasts this with what the world around them thought of the Son of Man himself. We begin reading in verse 13 again. It says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, well, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. It was a big deal to be considered one of these men, John the Baptist or Elijah or Jeremiah. All of these men had played, while they were still alive, had played a big role in preparing the way for the Messiah, preparing people's hearts for the promised Savior. But none of them were the promised Savior. Considering him as one of these individuals really missed an eternally important point, that he actually was the promised Savior. Now, in contrast, he asked his disciples personally to give a confession of who they believe he is. In verse 15, we see, he says, but what about you? He asked, who do you say I am? Well, Simon Peter answered, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. Speaking on behalf of the disciples, it's clear that they believe that Jesus was more than just a prophet. He was the Christ, or anointed one, that is, the Messiah. And in addition to that, the Son of God. This means that we can take confidence in everything that Jesus is going to say and do. The disciples' confession was the difference between heaven and hell. Without Jesus being their Savior, the people were still lost in the darkness of their sins, still wondering whether or not they ever could do enough to be saved or even liked by God. But were those disciples just that much wiser to get this point than anyone else? Well, absolutely not. You see, it really had nothing to do with them and everything to do with God and the work that his word was doing in their hearts. In verse 17, Jesus says as much. He said, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. Notice that Jesus calls Peter Simon, son of Jonah. And this underscored the fact that he was flesh and blood, and therefore a sinner who was born dead in his transgressions and sins, who by nature had a hostile mind toward God, a heart that wanted nothing to do with God or even with being saved by him. Jesus says, Peter is blessed. And that means that God has intervened in his life. This confession was revealed to him by God. In other words, the faith that he expressed, which clung to Jesus as the one and only Savior, was a gift from God, just as it is for all who believe. And this puts Jesus' following play on words into perspective. He says in verse 18, And I tell you that you are Peter. Literally, you are rocky. And on this rock, that is, a solid rock or a foundation, referring to Peter's confession of faith, his confession about who Jesus really was. On this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, the gates of death, will not overcome it. On Peter's confession of who Jesus is, that he is the Son of God, the promised Savior. That is what Jesus' church, his body of all believers everywhere, throughout all time and all places, is built on. Jesus' reputation is why his church has stood and endured through centuries of persecution and, and efforts by the world to silence it. No power or governing authority will ever be able to silence it or destroy it. Not because of the efforts of man, but because of Christ. In fact, it has been through times of outward persecution that God's church has spread the most. Even death will not be able to overcome it. And as surely as Jesus would rise from the dead victorious, so also his body, the church, will be raised victorious and glorious too. 
in one stanza of the church's one foundation, we didn't sing this stanza this morning, but it's really beautiful. And I just want to share it with you. It says, and it's talking about the church, Christ's church, right? That invisible body of made up of all believers of all time and all places. And it says, though with a scornful wonder, the world sees her oppressed by schisms rent asunder, by heresies distressed. Yet saints, their watch are keeping, their cry goes up, how long? And soon the night of weeping shall be the morn of song. Again, this means that in this world, what you see in visible churches can oftentimes be a mess, right? They, they look like they're failing. They look like the, all they're doing is, is arguing all the time. They're, they're oppressed on the outside. They're torn apart on the inside by false teachings and arguments and, and, and selfish, uh, uh, you know, arguments and things like that. And yet with all of that awful mess, with all of that awful reputation, it is Christ's reputation that sustains his body of believers in the midst of all of that mess, the side of heaven. In fact, that's why a person still goes to church, not because of my own reputation, how good or bad it might be, but because of Jesus' reputation. So if this is true, that God's church is built on Jesus' reputation and not our own. Does it even matter what we say or do? Well, yes. By God's grace, we do bear Christ's name, right? Just as Christians or believers started being referred to as Christians in Antioch in the first century. We bear Christ's name. And that means that the things that we do and say always have the opportunity to reflect someone and something that is unchanging. And that is, of course, our Savior, Jesus. When we pray the Lord's Prayer, Jesus taught us to ask that we keep God's name holy, right? We say, hallowed be thy name. And we understand that God's name is holy all by itself. He doesn't need our help to keep it holy. And nothing we can ever say or do will change that in a way. What Jesus teaches us in that part of the Lord's Prayer is to always have that question that he just asked his disciples on our hearts and minds. Who do you say I am? Who do I say God is? This is both convicting and comforting, isn't it? Because as Jesus' words often are that way for us, aren't they? It is convicting because as a person with a sinful nature, who I say Jesus is with my words and my actions, let's be honest, doesn't always reflect him or his word. When we turn a blind eye to the difficult parts of God's word or the portions that don't seem to be politically correct these days, or when we flat out just fail to love our neighbor, we, in effect, paint a picture of Jesus that is not true. We portray Jesus as a liar when in our selfishness and our pride, we refuse to forgive someone who has asked us to yet again. We give them the message that God couldn't possibly forgive something if it's too hurtful, too disgusting, or done too often. It's not true. Sometimes we portray Jesus as someone who just wanted to run roughshod over God's commands and, and promote a life that has no regard for God's will or his commands, as someone who isn't actually serious about us being holy and doesn't mean what he proclaims. When Jesus himself says, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect, we forget that the holiness that he has given to us is a beautiful gift in the sacrifice of his perfect life in exchange for all of our sin. But if Jesus is our Lord and the King of Kings, and the reputation of his church, his body of believers, is built on his own reputation, then as a part of it, we'll take his words seriously, right? If he says, 
that through the Holy Spirit, he has set us apart as God's holy people, not by our work, but by his gift, then we'll obviously take comfort in that gift. And we'll also take a second look at God's will in a whole new light. Instead of being afraid of its condemnation, we'll see how much God wants to bring us joy through these things. We will let our King of Kings use the sword of his law to expose whether where our hearts have been unfaithful to him and to one another, and will accept the authority that this law has in showing us that we have fallen short totally and completely. Likewise, if Jesus is our Redeemer and the friend of sinners, then we will daily come before him with all of our sin and ask for his mercy, confident in that gift. We'll trust the forgiveness that he has won for us and we'll believe his promises that he has washed our sin away and given us credit for his holy life before God. Friends, remember that in Jesus, you are a part of something bigger. You are a part of God's church, his body of believers, sinners who were once lost but are now found in Jesus, clothed in the perfect life of our Redeemer and confident in our relationship with God and our eternal future. The beautiful thing is that being a part of God's church, whose reputation is built on Christ. You may see churches and congregations come and go all around you throughout your life. But in Jesus, you have the certainty of being a part of something bigger and something that will last. You know, I have witnessed the closing of visible congregation before, and it wasn't at all what I expected it to be. I thought that it was going to be this sad and mournful event. But rather, I saw that it was a celebration of the beautiful things that God had done in people's hearts while God's word was proclaimed in that place. While people were baptized there and received the Lord's Supper there for the forgiveness of their sins and the strengthening of their faith. And that's because that congregation realized that they were a part of something vastly bigger and longer lasting than a colossal gathering of people across multiple services. The beautiful thing about being a part of God's church, which is built on his reputation, is that there is certainty there that brings me past myself so that I am more free than ever to serve and love my fellow believer in my congregation, more free than ever to serve and love my neighbor, my family member, or even a stranger. How? Because as a part of God's church, I'm not always worried about my own reputation and what someone else might say about me or think about me or my church. Rather, I find my identity in Jesus and what he says that he has done for me and who he says I am. There is nothing more freeing when it comes to sharing my faith with someone, admonishing someone, encouraging and lifting up someone, speaking the truth in love to someone than by God's grace, having been made a part of his family of believers. Then, sharing my faith isn't about me. His church isn't about me. It's about Jesus. There in him, I have nothing to be ashamed of. There, my visible congregation isn't about programs and numbers. Then my family isn't about just obeying and doing things. Then rather, it's all about Jesus. Right? Then even my marriage isn't about me getting what I want. It's about Jesus. Isn't that interesting? It really is all about Jesus, isn't it? Who do you say Jesus is? He is the Son of God. He is God's promised Savior for me and for you. He is worthy of my worship and praise. He is worthy of my life 
because he has given me eternal life by living and dying and rising again for me and graciously making me a part of his family, which will last forever. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.